almost immediately that anything I could tell you about hernias and hemorrhoids you could read in a book. But my experience over the last several months as a very ill surgeon is something that you could only hear from me, and I think it's as core as any other subject uh, that you could hear about. Again, I'm delighted to be back. I apologize for my long absence. I hope you will agree after I finish that I had a very good excuse. <laughs> By way of brief, brief background, let me take you back 13 years when most, I don't think any of you were here. I was 48 years old, ascending into the prime of my career. I had never been a patient in a hospital and had not taken a sick day since junior high school. I never smoked or drank, I was a competitive swimmer, and I had completed 15 triathlons. When Destiny decided to enroll me in a class on the wonders and wailings of being a patient, she was not timid. I was abruptly called to scale the Mount Haribachi of esophageal cancer, a memorable and comprehensive introductory course to say the least. The treatment regimen for this lethal cancer, a perennial cellar dweller with the pancreas, is as brutal as any in surgery. Chemotherapy, thank you very much. Chemotherapy, radiation, culminating in the infamous three-hole esophagectomy. There are actually quite a few more holes than three, I will tell you. After myriad complications, both physical and emotional, <clears throat> I returned to my practice two years and three months later, scarred, wiser, and freshly scrubbed with the emollient of humility. It was in the awful grip of that hopeless dark of days that this lifelong atheist found the sustenance of a very personal God. He is not that God confoundingly both loving and wrathful, casting down fate from on high. My God has no power over life or death, nor can he foretell the future any more than I can. But he is wise in the eons of the universe, and he exercises the power of indifference. My inspiration, therefore, is to be an extraordinary person who commands his attention and his love. He suffers when I suffer. He laughs when I laugh. He is my unwavering counselor and companion. He and I both understand and accept that I am alive in large measure due to blind, beautiful luck, and for that we are both eternally grateful. He will be no less constant comfort during this trial. I don't know why, but I speak to him only in Spanish. For the next several years, I endured, as all cancer patients must, the daily fear that every twinge announced the hydra of recurrent or metastatic disease. This is why cancer is the most feared word in our vocabulary. And the statistics lend me good reason to fear, a 90% mortality at 10 years. I distinctly remember Mac DeCamp, my saving surgeon then and now, telling me at two years we breathe a sigh of relief, at five years we whisper about a cure. But eventually I entered the phase, as all cancer patients must, peaceful coexistence with fear. Not a day passes that I don't think about the monster, but I do not grant it front row seating. As I came to this piece, I plunged back into my practice with a no exceptions asked vigor. I bit off six emergency call nights a month, including trauma. I wrote my story and appeared on national television. I wrote and continue to write many other stories about my patients and about my wonderment at the richness of the universe. I won the Matson Award four more times, establishing a professional legacy of which I am enduringly proud, and I witnessed the birth of my two miraculous sons, Martin and Matthias. Now an odds-defying 12-year survivor, a new concern began to creep into my thought, durability. The three-hole is designed to extirpate a dangerous cancer in the most radical way possible. Over the short term, it remains the most complication-ridden major operation in surgery. But we have relatively meager experience with how the operation holds up as a functional system well down the line. I have adapted to the various constraints, 
and more or less mastered these significant restrictions on eating that my operation has imposed. <clears throat> but will this jury rig contraption serve me another 20 years while I raise my two young boys? At 4.17 a.m., Sunday, May 25th, my pondering collapsed into catastrophic reality. I was awakened by a violent cough and a strider that threatened to asphyxiate me. The hideous taste of bile roiled up in the back of my throat, and within an hour I was voiceless. I could not have imagined I could become so ill so quickly. A pile driver had rammed down on top of me. As it happened, I was on call that Sunday. I paged my chief and told him inaudibly, please find someone to cover for me. I began coughing up copious unnatural secretions I did not believe any lung was capable of producing. Gross blood appeared. By evening I was, without exaggeration, feeling deathly ill. I scrawled a last will and testament note to my doctors detailing the anatomic vagaries of my previous surgery, which included a paralyzed left vocal cord and an anastomotic stricture in my neck. <clears throat> By the time I reached the hospital, my chest x-ray showed a raging bilateral pneumonia suggestive of aspiration. How so? Two weeks earlier, after returning from Argentina, I had developed severe substernal chest pain, non-cardiac, thought to be costochondritis. The pain resolved with ibuprofen. The medical folks were in a swivet of ecstasy that rather than another humdrum aspiration pneumonia, I had some sexy exotic tropical disease. Titers for every known pathogen were sent off. <clears throat> the truth turned out to be an anatomically exotic fluke, if not a tropical one. Bronchoscopy ultimately revealed, to everyone's amazement, a five millimeter perfectly formed stoma of what later proved to be gastric mucosa planted precisely at the carina of my trachea. Surgical staples were visible, as was bile. To Gabby's and my inestimable relief, there was no evidence of recurrent cancer. The bronchoscope slithered through the stoma into my otherwise normal appearing gastric conduit, proving a tracheogastric fistula, or was it a gastrotracheal fistula? And had I experienced hematemesis or hemoptysis, or both? Regardless of semantics, <clears throat> the carina is not a good place to have a stoma. At this point, I was critically ill and heavily sedated on a ventilator and any attempt to repair the fistula now through a previously operated and irradiated chest would likely have killed me. Mac understood this intuitively from years of experience. The immediate and urgent challenge was to control the fistula and stop the continued spillage of corrosive intestinal contents into my lungs. Given that I am now semi-comatose and without other pressing engagements, allow me to digress briefly. <clears throat> on this fistula phenomenon. Fistula is the Latin word for reed pipe, and I can assure you that mine was not whistling a happy tune. A fistula is a tissue line passage between two epithelial, mesothelial, or endothelial surfaces of variable length and tortuosity. Fistulae are the woe and bane of many a surgeon's practice and often notoriously difficult to eradicate. The gritty gastrointestinal surgeon bears the brunt of fistulopathy because the abdomen offers so many possibilities. Whether a fistula will close spontaneously depends on a multitude of factors, but under the right circumstances, nature can prove to be a remarkably and frustratingly dogged and peripatetic burrower. Chewing gum and superglue are to no avail a fistula that fails conservative management requires that the surgeon pull on his boot